The title of this presentation is Biliteracy for Students with Complex Needs. In this case, complex needs will refer to students with disability labels who have an individualized education program under the eligibility of speech language impairment, specific learning disability, intellectual disability, and autism. In 2015, the state of Wisconsin adopted the seal of biliteracy for all students, including students with complex needs. This is exciting for special education teachers, reading teachers, and reading specialists alike because it allows an opportunity to push past the limits of using only one language. Children with speech language impairments or learning disabilities can become fully bilingual and biliterate. See research by Genesee and colleagues and Perozzi and Sanchez. There is emerging evidence that children with intellectual disability and autism can become successfully bilingual and biliterate and that bilingualism does not disadvantage their language development. See research by K. Raining Bird and colleagues from 2005 and 2015. Limiting a child to one language, however, may disadvantage a child's language development. Indeed, the majority of people in the world are bilingual. Some of them have disabilities. Disabilities do not arise from being bilingual. They manifest in all or most contexts. Two key principles can guide our thinking about the potential of biliteracy for all children, including children with high intensity support needs. First, students learn best when they are taught in the language they understand. Second, knowledge gained in one language will transfer to another. Within a framework where biliteracy is valued as a potential outcome for all children, Instructional practices must also value and capitalize on a student's full range of linguistic resources. The language experience approach is an example of one such practice. Here's a brief breakdown of what the language experience approach, or LEA, is and who can benefit from LEA. Emergent and beginning readers of all ages can benefit from LEA because the method uses words and concepts with which students are familiar. In a nutshell, the teacher writes down what students say. In an alternative modified format, students can use assistive technology to have their voices and stories recorded. In the LEA model, Students and the teacher practice reading the dictated or recorded text. This is followed by a contextualized phonics mini lesson and practice to develop fluency with the recorded passage. Teachers can use LEA in a large group, small group, or a one-on-one -on -one context. In seven steps, this is how teachers typically use LEA. First, they have an experience with students and reflect on that experience. An example could be taking a field trip to the zoo, cooking something that all students then eat, or taking a sensory walk outside in the fall. Then teachers ask students to share their thoughts about the experience. As the students speak, the teacher takes dictation. Once the students complete the process of dictating a paragraph or passage or text, the teacher uses scaffolded oral reading to facilitate guided practice with reading and then rereading the dictated passage. This is followed by word work or phonics practice. In some cases, teachers focus on morphosyntactic patterns that emerge in the passage, such as the use of the apostrophe S possessive marker. Finally, students revisit the passage at a later point in time to reread with greater fluency and accuracy the dictated passage. LEA affords meaningful and authentic language learning events. It's also practical because teachers can implement LEA without needing to purchase or access costly curriculum materials. Researchers have tested a modified version of LEA. Displayed on the screen is a 10-step procedure for implementing the modified version of language experience approach to meet the needs of children with disabilities. This procedure was evaluated in a study that I conducted with my colleague April Muschian. The study included English language learners with developmental disabilities. 
All students in the study used Arabic as a home language. I will break down the 10 step process that we used in the next few slides. Step one, present sets of static clean boards and reusable stickers. Ask the student to select a setting and relevant reusable stickers. Ask the student to name the setting and objects represented by the reusable stickers. Listen to the responses generated and provide praise or state the word with a request for a repeat. These steps create the experience that will generate the language that we'll later write about. So this was facilitated through materials like static cling boards and reusable stickers. Step four is to facilitate discussion using the learner selected storyboard and reusable stickers to position the participant to dictate a meaningful text that represents the learner's own experiences and uses of more than one named language. Here's where the modification comes into play in step five and six. We had the student use speech to text and word prediction tools to dictate the story. In step six, we revisited the story, having the student listen to the transcribed text via the text to speech. In this case, it was the um, read and write for Google Chrome extension and allow the opportunity to make any edits to the story. This took the place of the teacher controlling the pen. So the student had um, agency and command over the keyboarding and writing process. In step seven, we provided sentence level instruction using a modified version of cut up sentences and the digital version of the student's dictated text. We inserted numbers in front of each sentence or presumed sentence rearranged the order of the sentences, and presented the scrambled sentences in digital form. Then we had the student put the sentences in correct order, or sequence them, to correspond with their original dictated story. So we added in a sequencing component of the instruction. In step eight, we revisited the Google Doc featuring the learner dictated text, allowing the student to choose whether to use text to speech to read that text this next time or to use their voice alone. In step nine, we provided word level instruction by conducting a word sort. This involved a selection of at least one word or pattern contained within the dictated text typed a bank of eight words and had the student sort four words that fit the pattern and four words that did not fit the pattern. Patterns varied based on what was available in the text. In some cases, there were identifiable phonograms that we focused on. In others, there were morphosyntactic patterns. We ended with a discussion of the meaning of the sorted words, making use of read and write for Google Chrome's dictionary, picture dictionary, and text-to-speech functionality. The final step, step 10, was to collect data while conducting a running record as the student read from their transcribed passage. We also calculated the and recorded the total words transcribed. LEA, or a modified language experience approach, offers language learning and literacy developments that place the student's own voices and experiences at the center of teaching and learning. Student-centered instruction is one of the principles of culturally responsive instruction. Another practice that can incorporate principles of culturally responsive pedagogy is computer-assisted, peer-mediated explicit instruction with embedded self-regulation procedures. One example of where you can find a practitioner-friendly article to suggest how to implement this is the work of Yayu Lo and colleagues in the Intervention School and Clinic Journal. Article is titled, Building Vocabulary of English Learners with Reading Disabilities, in this case, Learning Disability Eligibilities on their IEP, through computer-assisted morphology instruction. Another example is linked on Canvas in a study that I conducted with um, Shaquana Freeman Green and um, Terry Kasarowski and Karen Douglas. So that article included English language learners with learning disabilities 
um, and we used this peer-mediated computer-assisted instruction model as well. So peer-mediated computer-assisted academic vocabulary instruction highlights the socio-cultural context of shared language learning while also building on principles of self-regulated learning. The very first step in using this approach is to introduce self-regulation procedures. To introduce self-regulated learning in the study that I conducted with my colleagues, we led a discussion about the purpose of self-goal setting. Second, we modeled setting a goal to reflect the number of words we would like to be able to learn well enough to teach someone else with respect to the curriculum materials in front of us that had um, a finite number of possible words to learn for science and math curriculum. Students then practiced setting goals related to science terms. We gave feedback on the reasonableness and measurability of the goals that they set. Third, we role-played learning new words in the role of tutor in 2T. Fourth, we modeled self-assessing our level of understanding of the new words and self-evaluating whether we met the goal initially set. Fifth, we guided students through the self-evaluation process by comparing the number of words that they rated um, as being well known well enough to teach someone else against the number of words that they selected during their self-goal setting. After the self-regulation training, peer-mediated computer-assisted academic vocabulary instruction with embedded self-regulation procedures took place on consecutive school days during 20-minute sessions. Each student in the dyad worked with their partner to follow steps and navigate through a multimedia presentation. Um, the partnership or dyad was formed with two students who were performing at a similar level. In typical uh, reciprocal peer tutoring models, you would pair a high achieving student with a low achieving student. In this study, and in this case, we paired two students who were performing at similar levels, and we used the computer assisted instruction um, to serve as the strong language model. So the multimedia presentations offset that balance. Um, you can find a sample presentation for the word elaborate at peermediated.vocabulary.weebly.com. During the multimedia presentation, students were prompted by the computer and their partner to complete a word knowledge graphic organizer. All sessions began by stating record a goal to tell how many words you will rate at a level five today. Um, level five meant that you know the word well enough to teach it. Then students completed step one on the self-regulation sheet for self goal setting. During the final three minutes of that 20 minute session, we directed students to complete step two on the self-regulation sheet, which was self assessment and self evaluation. At the very end of every session, we collected data on students' expressive definitions for all of the words that we targeted on the multimedia presentations. This means that we followed a procedure to ask the students to use verbal language to express to us what the terms that they had practiced meant. We had a validated protocol for rating um, their expressive definitions and Data from this study showed that this model of peer-mediated computer-assisted instruction with these components of self-goal setting and self-evaluation um, served to increase expressive vocabulary for all participants in the study at levels that exceeded the respective baseline performance levels and at levels that showed a clear replication of the effect across participants. So we have good evidence that this method of instruction was effective for building vocabulary. So this presentation is given two ideas for language experience approach and vocabulary instruction that can be implemented to support literacy and biliteracy development for emergent bilingual students with complex needs.